What happens when you get to that really bad boundary? When the wavelength of your energy approaches the dimensions of your biological structures? All those assumptions now collapse. And you actually really have to consider how the interaction is going to be. So, we started this work way back in 2008 when we'd actually seen images similar to this for the first time of human skin. This is an OCT image of living human skin. OCT is optical coherence tomography. Basically, it's a method of imaging the skin as skin. That we happen to have a very high-end vector network analyzer which could send a signal, anything from 75 gig all the way up to 110 gig, onto the skin of a person and read what comes back. It's a simple experiment, if you put it that way. So what we did, we made a nice little protocol. We, we measured the hands of people while they sat there calmly. Then we made them run around this particular campus two or three times. So they came back extremely stressed, sweating profusely. Dried their hands so we wouldn't have any problem and measured the hand again and looked at what we could see. What we could see resulted in this particular article published in 2008 where we basically stated that these things could work like helical antennas. But the sweat duct was an integral part of the mechanism for the absorption of energy, electromagnetic, between 75 to 110 gig. And that if you changed the character of the sweat duct, i.e. made it work, you could actually change that absorption in some way. And if you could do that, you could then trace how a person is under stress. Um, now, we did a lot of tests to make sure. We even made sure the sweat duct wouldn't work by neutralizing the nerve endings, and we could see the differences. We followed that up with a more in-depth uh, view of this, and we also looked at things like uh, stress, not by being made to run around a campus, but by just being made to think rather heavily. And we could still find traces, and we could still see traces of the stress levels in the reflection coefficient. We've got very nice correlations in, in, in this sense. So, so pretty clearly, um, there is a mechanism, and it's quite nice that at least in that particular frequency level, um, the skin is absorbing, and, and the main, if you like, motivator of that absorption would be the sweat duct. And this is all before we'd even realized that these industry standards were going to come out for 5G. Now, we finally put the nail in the coffin, in our opinion, when we proved there was also curality in the reflection coefficient. As was a software, uh, Gal Schafferstein also came to the same conclusion, and he went one stage further than us. He actually looked at SAR rates as well. Now, he did this because the American army had commissioned him to explain why their 94 gigahertz crowd dispersal gun made people run away when the beam touched them. This beam is two gigawatts in strength. It's two meters across. And if you are unlucky enough to be standing there when it hits you, you feel like your body's on fire. You will run away, and you will find out that you're perfectly OK, more or less. So they commissioned him to find out why. And he had a, an amazing discovery when he looked at the SAR rates. And he found that, preferentially, the SAR rate was going very high inside the sweat duct as compared to the surrounding tissue. So there's already some evidence that there's a physical influence could be on us from, from him. This patient for 5G. Um, what worries me is that it's basically an industry panel, and it is not independent. Um, and as you can see, they are making quite good progress. And within two years, you said, Darius? Yeah. Two years. We, we should have this everywhere, all over us. And this has not been looked at. Nobody's really considering what health effects could be because of that mechanism, which we've proven to exist. It, it's there. Nobody's really considering what it can be. These specifications, they're not really considering them for like wide area cellular networks. They're considering the 5G for basically very high end, high data transmission, at least on the level of wireless inside building, inside room. Now, they can do that. Now, there is a problem at around about 550 gigahertz, strong absorption line from oxygen. 660 gigahertz, strong absorption line from atmospheric water, etc., etc., etc. So they'll concentrate down to about 300. Um, by the way, for those that are interested, there's also quite strong absorption line from alcohol at about 330. So that could also be interesting in certain countries where maybe they drink too much. But <laughs> what it means that 
in a room such as this with a wireless system based on 5G, you can push ultra high rates with terabit uh, transmission rates of information. So in terms of what you can get on your cell phone, it's, it's ginormous. However, um, you've got to think of what will be the wattage they're going to be using. And this is the real question. If at the moment you are working with a cell phone which is pushing out milliwatt, and that's problematic, and a base station two kilometers away pushing out 120 watt, which if you're near it can be a killer, yeah? or if you're working in your wireless networks where once again you're talking about milliwatts power, it's reasonable to assume that they're going to be, I think, four times higher, you said, Darius? Four times higher. What's what going to be four times higher? The typical wireless uh, router in your room based on 5G. Yeah. In terms of, it won't be quite terahertz, but it'll be the sub-terahertz level, but it'll be pushing out, you know, wattage. Implemented already, or beginning to be implemented, and, and in 2017, <coughs> 18, uh, in Finland it will be, Australia is coming also. But we don't have slightest idea how human skin responds to RF EMF. Not at all. Starting fr from GSM we have only one study. But 5G technology, this spectrum, energy will be deposited solely in the skin. So meaning that skin will take all absorption, all other organs will be not really absorbed or, or affected or unless indirectly from responses within the skin. But this what Ignir is planning, they are planning to classify skin as limbs. What? As limbs. Meaning all skin in our body will be classified as belonging to limbs. So because they divide body into head and trunk and limbs. Head and trunk are those most important vital parts of our body, so our head, our trunk, but limbs are, for example, our arms, our legs, our ears are also, our nose, they can be more exposed to radiation. But that was okay for 1G, 2G, 3G technology, where this radiation was getting inside and in irradiating our brain inside. Now, 5G exposes only skin, but if you classify skin as limbs, no matter where the skin is, you are permitted to expose it more than otherwise. There is an urgent need to evaluate health effects, including the skin physiology of 5G before it is implemented and people are exposed. Here we are going again into a new technology uh, without any knowledge of what this might mean on health effects. Uh, what we know so far at this time or the, the sweat ducts are very strong absorbers of 5G ra radiation, but we're not aware of any adequate health effects studies on 4G or 5G. So we need to evaluate if 5G, for example, increases the risk of skin diseases such as melanoma or epithelioma. And we also believe there's a need to examine brains of rodents exposed to RF in utero during lactation for dendrite outgrowth, since uh, this may be linked to uh, the autistic syndrome. Exposure. Um, the second um, here I will show you is um, from virtual reality. Now, the virtual reality, um, have any of you used a virtual reality device? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Well, here's one. It was uh, being uh, marketed to uh, eight-year-olds, okay? And they can hold it right here, and they can take a trip to the moon. smartphone that is emitting and sending and receiving wireless radiation. And they have never been tested. They've never been tested for uh, their exposure or for any safety limits at all into the young brain with a thinner skull which contains more fluid. And leaving aside the social, cultural, and other factors that one might want to be concerned about. This data, I would conclude that in terms of the IR classification, that radio frequency fields are a probable human carcinogen, IRC category 2A. Now we're going to hear information on mechanistic data in this Congress, and uh, we know we've already heard data on the animal studies, and altogether, if the mechanistic data correspond with the, um, with the animal studies, 
And with the epidemiology we now have, I think most working groups would say category one. But we're not there yet, and it doesn't look as though IARC are going to be able to uh, look at this or are prepared to look at it. We must remember radio frequency fields are now ubiquitous. Even if the risk for individual is low, it is widely distributed and could become a major public health problem. And the precautionary principle, which I know we're going to discuss tomorrow, must be applied now.